Hi everyone. In this video, I am going to demonstrate various options that are available to you for carrying out principal components analysis using the Jamovi program. Jamovi is a free open source statistical program that you can easily obtain by going to this link right here. And I will include this link underneath the video description. Um, I'm also going to include a copy of the raw data, uh, which is saved in an SPSS file and a PowerPoint which is going to contain really a lot more information than, than I'm going to provide in this video. Uh, specifically, the PowerPoint goes into uh, substantial detail on interpreting output and uh, various rules of thumb and, and uh, various issues related to PCA. So be sure to check it out. It also has a number of uh, references that you can look at as well. Additionally, the example and the data are actually uh, derived from this website right here, uh, specifically this page uh, from the Institute for Digital Research and Education. On this page they provide a discussion of principal components analysis and more specifically how to interpret SPSS output. So although I'm not going to really spend much time talking about SPSS in this demonstration, this is where the example and the data are coming from. So if you want to visit the site, uh, I will also include a link underneath the video description for you to be able to do so. Now briefly, before we open up the data in the Jamovi program, this is SPSS. It's opened up under the variable view. But the, what we're going to be looking at is carrying out a principal components analysis on these items right here. So uh, basically these are uh, survey items reflecting the perception of instructor of their of a course instructor and the course itself. So you have basically student perceptions of the instructor as being well prepared, having a scholarly grasp, having confidence, uh, having focused lectures and so forth. So it is essentially, we're essentially using items 13 through 24 from this survey. So let's go ahead and open up the Jamovi program. This is it, and the data is actually already imported. Um, you can actually just continue on, and you can see there's a lot more variables in there than what I'm showing you. But to carry out our PCA, what we're going to do is uh, go up here to the top, click on the factor button right here, and then we're going to click on principal component analysis. So we'll click that. And then as we do this, you can see now we have the variables appear on the left uh, that uh, we could potentially analyze. And we're just going to move uh, our items over to the box on the right under variables. So I'm going to click on item 13 and basically highlight all the way down to item 24. We're going to move it over to the variables box. And so you can see that whatever we do on the left is going to be reflected in the output on the right. So some of the things that I'm going to go ahead and click on, I'm going to click on Bartlett's test, uh, KMO measure of sampling adequacy. Um, you'll notice, too, that um, the default approach to uh, identifying the number of components is parallel analysis. Uh, we could also theoretically click on this button right here, and this would be uh, identification of the number of components based on the eigenvalue cutoff rule, which is to retain components with an eigenvalue that's greater than one. But again, the default is uh, using parallel analysis. Also, there's an option at the bottom right here where if we wanted to specify a fixed number of components uh, to retain, we could do that as well. Nevertheless, let's go ahead and fill out some of the rest of this. We're going to click on Component Summary. Uh, we're going to click on Initial Eigenvalues and Scree Plot. And so now you can see, as we kind of uh, look through all this, first off, uh, let's just take a quick look at the assumptions checks. So this right here. So you can see that we have Bartlett's test and we have the KMO measure of sampling adequacy. And both of these are really used to evaluate whether or not it was even appropriate to carry out the components analysis on our correlation matrix. So uh, Bartlett's test, if this is statistically significant, then that would be an indication that the sample correlation matrix is significantly different from an identity matrix where uh, there are no correlations among the measured variables. And so in this case, you can see that it is statistically significant. Uh, we also have the measure of sampling adequacy, the overall measure, and then measures associated with each of the individual items. So, uh, you know, really the, the lowest 
you know, quote unquote acceptable, if you will, uh, value is 0.50. And if you look in that uh, PowerPoint that I was referencing, um, I actually give various ranges uh, for uh, talking about how adequate we're talking about. So um, a 0.50 is sort of the lowest bound that, uh, in terms of adequacy. And then basically, as we get closer to one, we have a better uh, indication of the appropriateness of carrying out the analysis on that matrix. Uh, also, we have the measure of sampling adequacy for each of the individual uh, items in this particular analysis. And so that can be useful for, hel for helping to identify uh, you know, basically poor functioning items uh, in terms of how they relate, interrelate with the other items. So you can see that all of these values are pretty high. They're actually uh, uh, very close to one, uh, suggesting that we have, um, that it is reasonably appropriate to carry out the analysis on our correlation matrix. Next, we'll scroll down. You can see that we have the initial eigenvalues. Uh, that are given. So we have the component numbers that are given right here. The number of components will equal the number of measured variables in our analysis. And you can see the eigenvalues right here that are given. And so, you know, basically the default, if we set this up as parallel analysis, the default is to retain as many uh, components as that have the eigenvalues from our data that exceed a randomly generated eigenvalues. And so uh, you can actually see the randomly generated eigenvalues in this uh, screen plot down below. Um, so you, the randomly generated eigenvalues are those that are kind of in the cream color. Those are the simulated eigenvalues. And then the eigenvalues from the data that you see right up here are reflected in blue in this particular plot. And so basically you can see that the first, uh, the eigenvalue from the first component uh, exceeds a randomly generated eigenvalue, which is this one right here. And then the eigenvalue for the second component is somewhat above the simulated eigenvalue here, but then all of the remaining eigenvalues from our uh, raw, da from our, uh, raw data um, are falling below the simulated eigenvalues. So that would actually suggest a two-component solution. Um, you know, if we were just using the scree plot by itself, then uh, essentially what we would be doing is, uh, you know, kind of looking at this in terms of, you know, where do the eigenvalues sort of taper off or kind of level out um, in this particular plot. So if you think about the scree plot as kind of um, as an analogy, the side of a mountain, basically, you know, those eigenvalues that are falling on the primary slope are basically representing uh, the, the more dominant components, and then where the uh, at the base of the mountain, where you know things look like rubble, where you, where it looks like you basically have rubble, then that's where um, you would make the cut. So we essentially would make the cut at this point right here. Um, so that would suggest a two-component solution as well. So the other uh, possible uh, approach is to use the eigenvalue cutoff rule. If we click on this, you would also see. Uh, that reflected up here. And so basically, the eigenvalue cutoff rule, if that's invoked, that's also indicating that we would have a two-component solution. Basically, the idea is that uh, we would retain those components with eigenvalues that are at least one. Uh, so you can see that components one and two both meet that criteria. And so really, based on all three criteria, we would have um, a two-component solution that's represented. You can also see the percentage of variance accounted for by each of the um, components. And here for the retained component, the first retained component is 52.08%. For the second one, it's a little bit over 10%. So cumulatively, they, uh, those two first components would account for about 62% of the variation. Okay, so once you've sort of made the decision about how many um, components to retain, the next decision that you really have to make is uh, how do you name the, those components? Um, and so what we do is we look at the uh, loading matrices. So you'll notice that over here, by default, it says rotation Veramax. Technically speaking, um, in terms of the, the um, components that are retained, uh, if you click on none, then basically you have you will have an unrotated uh, component matrix, and these are generally pretty difficult to interpret, or often difficult to interpret. So we don't spend a lot of time trying to interpret those. Most of the time, we will adopt a rotation method, uh, such as an orthogonal rotation or an oblique rotation. Uh, 
Uh, orthogonal rotation basically maintains the condition that uh, the components are uncorrelated, whereas an oblique rotation would uh, allow for correlated components. So of the uh, orthogonal rotations, the, probably the most common one is Vermax. So we'll click on that. And so when you're interpreting uh, the, uh, the rotated components, so you can see down here it says Vermax rotation was used. Um, what we would also want to do is to look at essentially the correlations between the measured variables and the components. So basically the loadings within this matrix are correlations. And what you have to do is to establish a threshold for what constitutes um, a measured variable loading high enough onto a given component to use that measured variable as a in, when you're naming that component. So by default, uh, you can see right here it says hide, it, hide loadings below 0 0.30. So some of this, the spaces that you see in this particular matrix right here, there are uh, loadings that are estimated, but because those values fall below 0.3, uh, they are basically being uh, suppressed. If you wanted to see you know, basically all of the loadings, we could actually just uh, type in 0 right here, and you could see all of the loadings uh, represented. Um, but, you know, let's say, for instance, that we're going to adopt a loading criteria of 0 0.40. So there are a variety of different thresholds out there for uh, what constitutes an acceptable loading. Uh, the loading criteria that we're going to use is 0 0.40, and that's also what we use in the PowerPoint that I was talking about. So if we use that loading criteria right here, you can see that uh, item 13 meets that criteria on component 1, but doesn't meet it on 2. Item 14 loads onto 1, but not 2. Uh, item 15 on 1, but not 2. 16 on 1, and not 2. So that's actually good. That's what we want. We want uh, the measured variables to exhibit higher loadings on one component and very low, hopefully near zero loadings on, um, on the other component. Um, item 17 is loading and meeting that criteria on both components. So item 17 is likely not to be a good uh, item when it comes to trying to name either of those two components. So I'm going to actually scratch this out right here. And we'll say item 18 loads onto component 2, but not 1. 19 loads onto component 2, but not 1. 20 loads onto 2, but not 1. And then item 21 appears to load onto both um, components. So I'm actually going to not include that when it comes to interpretation. Uh, item 22 loads onto uh, component 2. And then items 23 and items 24 both meet the loading criteria on both of these components. And so they're not particularly useful either. So based on uh, the pattern of loadings, I would interpret uh, essentially uh, component 1 uh, in terms of the perception that students have of the instructor effectiveness and on component two I'm going to uh, call that perceptions of the uh, student centeredness of the instructor and you'll notice that obviously the names of these items are just items 13 14 15 so uh, where I came up with that is basically going back to the individual items and what the content of those items were. And so that's how I'm actually naming those particular um, those components. Now you'll also see under uh, component statistics, you'll see uh, that you have the eigenvalues for the rotated uh, components that were retained, uh, percentage of variance accounted for, and then the cumulative percentages. And basically, um, the eigenvalues and the percentage of variance accounted for by each of those components are not going to mirror the initial eigenvalues and percentage of variance accounted for by the components. But, the, uh, but what you will see is that the cumulative percentage of variance is actually going to mirror the cumulative percentage um, in this column right here for the first two components. Finally, let's, uh, instead of using Vermax rotation, let's use Promax rotation. So this is an oblique rotation, um, essentially allowing for the components to be correlated. So I'm going to click on this and when we do this we are also going to want to um, incorporate the, comp the component correlations in our output. 
So let's go back down. You can see that the initial table that we had with the initial eigenvalues, all of this is exactly the same as what we had before. Um, also, the scree plot uh, that was given and the, um, and the um, parallel analysis results are basically going to be all the same as well. So all that's the same. Where things are going to really differ is in terms of uh, the interpretation of the loading matrices. So what you see up here, uh, you can see Promax rotation was uh, used, and you'll notice that basically this is what's referred to as a pattern matrix. So if we were using uh, SPSS and running our analysis, we would actually have two matrices that we could theoretically interpret following rotation. There's a structure matrix which uh, contains the correlations between the measured variables and the components, and then there's a pattern matrix which essentially reflects the relationship between the measured variables and the components while controlling for the fact that the components themselves are intercorrelated. So what's given in Jamovi by default here is the pattern matrix. And so we can interpret this um, using the same loading criteria uh, that we use in the context of, um, of our previous interpretation of the loading matrices. So we're going to, again, we're going to use uh, a criteria of 0.4. So you can see item 13 meets that criterion on component 1, not so on component 2. Item 14 uh, uh, has a high loading on 1, but not 2. Item 15, again, on 1, but not 2. 16 on 1, but not 2. Uh, 17 on 1, and not 2. And then 18 loads highest on uh, component 2. Item 19 on 2 item 20 on 2. You can see item 21 loads onto 2 as well, but not 1. Uh, item 22 and uh, loads onto component 2. Item 23 loads um, meets the criteria on component 1. And item 24 meets the criteria on component 1. So in general, um, I've already kind of looked at this before, and, I, and pretty much uh, we're going to assume a similar uh, naming scheme with respect to those components that we talked about uh, uh, previously. So we'll call component one, again, uh, perceptions of instructional effectiveness, and component two, perceptions of uh, student-centeredness. And if we scroll down a little bit, you can see right here we have a component matrix, and this is the correlation between the two components. So basically there's a fairly uh, good correlation, it's 0.657, between uh, the perception uh, of instructional effectiveness and the perception of student centeredness. So that concludes this demonstration. Um, again, let me recommend you download the PowerPoint. Um, as I said before, there's a lot more detail in there than I'm really uh, covering in this particular uh, video. So be sure to download that and the data and uh, give Jamovi a try.